All right. Looks like the joining has slowed down a little bit. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to our webinar on topics for leaders navigating the future of work. Uh, this session is based on General Assembly's EMAG, the index. Uh, and I think the, the kind of call out that I saw in the foreword from Ella um, was kind of framing the shift from thinking about the new normal to thinking about what's next. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to have some panelists here who I'll introduce in a moment who are going to talk about some of those topics around what's next uh, with regard to different areas of, of their expertise and different areas that are of interest to General Assembly and hopefully to all of you. Um, General Assembly is a global company that helps employers thrive amidst rapid change. And we do this by helping employers close the skill gaps that exist in their organizations by building and maintaining diverse talent pools, new and diverse talent pools. Um, we support organizations in that by offering expert-led training um, and learning experiences, and that includes workshops, accelerators, and all of those have a blend of instruction, coaching, hands-on practice, self-paced, and asynchronous learning. Um, and we specialize in digital capabilities, so AI, data, software development, digital marketing, and digital transformation. I'm joined today by Christoph Narink, the former CMO of Walgreen Boots, um, Kevin Lyons, who's a data science and technology executive, and Song Velte, who is the UX director at Jellyfish. Uh, and I just want to note, it's 1 a.m. for Song, and so I really appreciate you joining us so, so early in Friday. Uh, and we were joking earlier that you'll have to tell us how Friday is. Um, so uh, Q1, the, the first question that I have for everybody is around the EMAG itself. So General Assembly uh, put this first issue together to share the expertise of our standard boards, of which all of you are, are members. Um, and I think uh, one of the, the observations I made as I read it is that transformation is hard. And, and so being able to learn from each other is really valuable. Uh, and so I'm curious if you can share a little bit about your involvement in the, the project, uh, why you wanted to participate and what your motivations for engaging with us on this, this magazine were. Kevin, maybe you can get us started. Sure. Um, so uh, as data science uh, continues to be a hot field, I'm regularly asked uh, what by people what they need to learn to break into it. And I'm, I'm always happy to give my own idiosyncratic advice based upon my own personal experiences. Uh, but I've, I've always felt that a more general and, and systematic approach is needed to these sorts of things. And uh, that a, a, an approach that takes into account uh, business needs and, and everyone's uh, personal backgrounds. So as a result, I'm, I'm very happy to help General Assembly uh, identify the skills that the next generation of data scientists will need to grow and prosper. That's great. Thank you. Christoph, Song? I yeah, sure. I mean, for me, it was was very similar. I mean, on the one hand, indeed, uh, because I think, you know, and I'm coming at this from a marketing perspective, you know, I, I think th there's loads of challenges, whether it's around privacy, data strategies, whether, whether it's around data driven marketing and how to do that with all of the challenges that are being thrown at us or opportunities, as we can call them, uh, you know. There's no one single marketeer that has the right answer to these questions. And I think as a panel, I can share hopefully my experience that might be helpful to, to some people, but equally, you know, uh, sitting on a panel with also diverse skills, you know, UX, data, etc. You know, I learned myself as well from these panels. So, uh, and, and frankly, in all transparency, I also brushed up a little bit <laughs> on some things uh, ahead of the panel because, you know, you, you, you want to make sure you have the latest, greatest. Uh, so, so, you know, uh, for me, it's equally sharing as in a learning opportunity in itself. For me, it's, uh, it's primarily because of my background as a designer. Um, I'm a self-taught designer, so I learned a lot from the community. Um, you know, back back in the day, and still do so. Anything that I can share with the the design community and the larger in, industry as a whole, like I, I love that I'm being able to do that, and for General Assembly to pull pull all of us all of us together to do this. Awesome, thank you. To get started, then with the sharing and the and the learning. Um, Focusing on one of the key areas in the magazine, kind of data and how data is changing organizations. 
Uh, there were some key takeaways there around what organizations need to think about in terms of changing kind of data discussion to a data strategy and, and really understanding how to make data impact their organizations in a meaningful way. Uh, beyond the buzzwords, what practical steps should leaders be taking to incorporate data into the day to day to build data driven culture and decision making and to really transform the way the organization operates and Kevin I'll, I'll throw this one over to you. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yes, I am, because you guys told me to be when I'm not talking. Uh, so I think the article points to uh, three actions that need to be undertaken. Uh, first uh, is that to, to, to change an organization, um, the entire organization must uh, develop a, a data strategy. Uh, and, that, and, 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 and people have to recognize that that data strategy and, and all the types of change that you need to do have to come from the top. Otherwise, um, you're gonna be duplicating a lot of efforts and efforts are just going to lack lack in, in impact. Um, and in fact, you really need to get uh, senior leaders together, chief digital officers, uh, CFOs, CEOs, CMOs, whatever, uh, and they have to uh, understand that they need to invest in analytics, uh, and they need to invest in analytic resources, uh, and uh, to make this work. Um, I think one of the one of the, the first things that you need to do when you're when you're first starting out uh, is creating some sort of data analytics or data science uh, center of excellence is a great place to begin. Uh, you, this is a group that can be responsible for aligning projects, uh, agreeing on metrics of success, uh, making sure that groups communicate uh, and, and that problems are being solved efficiently and quick, uh, quickly, but also that problems are being solved that are important to the company. Um, so that was one point. The second is um, these groups can't uh, work in isolation. It's 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 very important uh, that they not be fully separated from the rest of the company. Uh, they need to be structured in a way that encourages cross-team collaboration, uh, cross-team communication, uh, and they probably need to be encouraged uh, it, by 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 where it really counts and and in terms of performance reviews and and bonuses to make sure that everyone understands that this is actually important and you will be held accountable for it. Um, part of that is uh, giving people the ability to expand their skills in an area, uh, uh, you know, upskill a little bit. Uh, and also in time, as your, your, your company becomes more and more um, familiar with data, data science, uh, going from this move, slowly migrating from a center of excellence to sort of democratic, democratizing, I hate that word, uh, data and data analytics across the organization. Uh, I think uh, third, I would say third is about storytelling, which is a really important aspect of data science. Uh, and, the, and, and here it needs to be that the team has to be able to share the, their, their wins with the wider experience and what they're working on and why it makes a difference. Um, uh, making sure people understand where synergies can be uh, and where potential wins can be in the future is, is really important to get buy-in. Uh, but even with that, people have to be patient. This, can, this is a, a long-term goal. It's, it's not going to change your, your organization is not going to change in three months or six months. Uh, in fact, it will never fully change. It's, it ha you have to keep at this forever. I think finally, and I don't uh, just my own personal thought on this is that it's really important to promote upskilling, upskilling. Um, uh, and to do that, I think it's very beneficial to create a, a very formalized standardized development framework. Uh, but what, when you're doing that, you have to recognize that um, a variety of business roles come into contact with data and training needs to need, training needs to be suited to each one's specific uh, requirements. Um, everything from uh, upskilling very technically to uh, just people that who encounter data, just making sure they understand how to properly interpret something like aggregated data. Thank you. Uh, some of the things that I, I heard you talk about are the, the, the cross-functional nature of, of these types of initiatives, that they need to be kind of top-down and bottom-up. You need top-down alignment around the strategy, but you need bottom-up efforts to skill, to reskill, to train, uh, and that it's, it's kind of really about the impact across the organization and incentivizing the impact so that people get aligned around the, the outcomes. Um, as a product person, one of the things that someone, uh, a former colleague of mine drilled into me is that you got to think forward to the features and capabilities you'd like to have 
and then think about how you build the data systems that emit the data that you need to get there. And I think that is, aligns with your points that it's really about being intentional along the way and, and really kind of thinking that through. Um, connecting that to kind of a major source of data today, thinking about third-party cookies. Uh, Christoph, the, the magazine goes into detail about the deprecation of third-party cookies, the impact that that might have on marketing efforts that companies large and small, whether that's advertising, whether it's how you do audience segmentation, there's a, a lot of different impacts. Um, can you provide some tips and some approaches that marketing organizations might consider to mitigate the impact of, of third-party cookie deprecation? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, the, the first thing to say is that, of course, uh, the third party cookie is just one uh, challenge or opportunity that is being thrown at data driven marketeers. You know, you had the changes in iOS 14 where, you know, you need to consent to have your track to cross apps, etc. or iOS devices. Now, iOS 15 has this feature of hide your email or you're not getting back, you know, the opening rates. If somebody opens up an email, I think the stat is somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of emails get opened. And that, so it's, it's just one of the many challenges. And of course, those come about behind, you know, greater attention being paid um, to, uh, you know, privacy concerns, etc., which I think is absolutely right. So I think as a uh, as, as a marketeer, we, 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 we owe it to our consumers to deal with this, I guess. But in terms of what we can concretely do, and, and in particular around the, the third party cookie, but I think some of these strategies are also relevant, uh, you know, relating to some of the other challenges or opportunities that I've mentioned. I think, you know, the first thing is, is probably around <clears throat> rethinking your data collection strategy. And with that, I mean, you know, first party data is like gold dust, you know, that's because that's data that you have yourself and you're not reliant on a cookie that's being placed on your computer and that will disappear, etc. You know, you, you own that data yourself. So if, if as a marketeer, uh, and it links back to Kevin's point around having a clear data strategy in terms of what data do you need? Not too much data either, because again, if you just gather data for the sake of gathering data, it, it's also not right. You know, think really about what is the consumer experience that I want to deliver and what data do I need to be able to enable that? Uh, you know, so that's the first uh, big thing, because once you have that first party data, you can actually go if you have people's email addresses, you can go into those walled gardens and find those consumers back. And then within those walled gardens, you can look up, do lookalike modeling and whatever have you. But if you don't have that first party data, you have nothing to go into those kind of walled gardens like the Googles, the Facebooks, et cetera, of this world. And then you have platforms like, you know, with that work based on universal IDs that again, allow you to build those audiences out. You can work with second data party providers, et cetera. So there's lots of things that you can be doing in terms of overcoming this. You inevitably will initially be hit with a smaller audience size. Uh, but I said, as you build this out, um, you know, you need that first party data to at least have a stake in the ground where you can start building from. So that's the first big, um, you know, passionate plea around first party data and the right amount of first party data. I think the second thing to really have a close look at is when you think about that customer experience that you want to deliver, is like, have a look at your MarTech stack. What do you have? Do you have, for example, a proper, you know, customer data platform uh, or, or a DMP in which you can actually store that data and start building those audiences with which you can then go to a, a walled garden to find those consumers back? Uh, you know, um, do you have a, a proper CRM system in place? Um, do you have a website personalization tool? I mean, that's what, in my experience, delivers usually the biggest, um, value cases. It's it's something around precision media. Uh, it's something around CRM, and it's something around website personalization. That's where I saw the biggest you know sales drivers uh, coming to life. And again, think about in those areas. Do I have the right Martech stack in place? The other thing I would say though is you know that's all good, but then going back to good old segmentation skills and knowing your consumer so that you can start finding them in other platforms, even if you don't have that identifier. Because I said iOS 15 is, 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 you know, is, is creating a few new challenges there. If you can hide your email address, how are you going to find those consumers back as well? So do not underestimate the importance of good old segmentation skills and knowing your consumer so you can do contextual targeting um, uh, of your ads. So I think it's a combination of first party 
quality data, MarTech stack, and then uh, of course, you know, building that those segmentation skills and, and, and knowledge of, of your consumer. That's probably the main tips. Clearly, you need to upskill your organization. And you need to make sure that you provide these consumer with a value exchange in terms of content that is relevant to them as, as well. But I would say from a technical perspective, those are probably the first places to start. Thank you. So thinking about that, right now, I th there's a little bit of distrust of, of companies in terms of the data they're collecting and, and what they might use it for. Um, with that in mind, how do you go about building first party data collections it, it, and kind of maintaining trust with your customers? And, and what are some approaches that you can take to kind of create value for customers that makes it feel like there's a more even exchange of, of value right there. I mean, I think the joke that gets thrown around is like, if you can't figure out what the product is, it's, it's you. And, and so like, how do we mitigate that type of, of perception? Yeah, and I think the stat is that I think was it about 40% of Americans feel that marketeers are a bit too intense in the way they've been followed around different platforms and, and different apps, etc. So, uh, and of course, that, that does create this trust. So I, I couldn't agree more with what you said. I think, you know, there needs to be a balanced value exchange whereby if a consumer gives you their data, what are they getting in exchange? But I, I guess, you know, prior to that, and there's actually, uh, the link is actually in the article. There's a really good small, quick read. I think it takes about 20, 20 minutes to read a uh, booklet of this uh, nonprofit uh, think do tank in terms of, you know, data ethics. And it's all around, you know, you're dealing with humans and put humans at the center and almost think about, if this is my child or my significant other, would I do this or that with their data? So again, it's a mindset thing. It's about you know individual data control, transparency, accountability in the organization of you know making sure that that people and that you have the right processes in place and you have accountability for treating data in the right way and equality, which is around protection of you know vulnerable groups. Think about what's happening the whole debate around Facebook these days. So I think you know they they, they provide a really helpful framework to just help you think about am I doing the right thing so once you have reassured yourself through their little questionnaire that you're doing the right thing uh, you know um, then, then I think it's about being conscious around that value exchange and you know what are you giving consumers in exchange for uh, their data and there's several things you know there's gated content that could be really valuable to them um, again and it goes back to really knowing your consumers and what they're looking for and what they value i'll give a personal example it happened last night actually i was looking for an eames chair you know that's one of those very designy chairs can't afford a real one so i was looking for a replica but actually there was one provide and you have tons of manufacturers and, and of course some of them are pretty bad and some are pretty good and so there was one uh, manufacturer that basically had behind a gated content so I had to provide my email address a very detailed it was like 10 pages long document around how to spot a good replica versus a bad replica and you know I gave them my email address because that was really valuable content to me and actually on the back of that I trusted them so much that I bought one of them <laughs> but, you know uh, because you could see they really know their their stuff uh, and so so you know it's about what's the value exchange it could be for example in my previous role I was responsible for a skincare brand it was actually a personalized skincare diagnostic based on a selfie and you know that was providing value to consumers on then knowing what's the state of their skin what you know might they be using it would be gamification uh, and a real nice experience so it could be all kinds of things but really it comes down to what what is your consumer looking for and what would be valuable to your consumer so that there is a real value exchange so so again that would be my two tips is do what is ethical and use that kind of little questionnaire and then secondly uh, be conscious around that value exchange there are, there's a lot there that I think is really valuable. You talked a little bit about being human centric and, and keeping the human at the center. Uh, and then you also started to talk on things that kind of sound like features to me in terms of specific content that you can provide as a feature or specific enhancements like a skincare uh, assessment you can give somebody through a selfie. Uh, when I think about kind of human centered parts of things that makes me think of design. And, and so I think that's a good transition point song to, to you. Um, the article talks a little bit about how the, or the, there's an article in the mag that talks a little bit about how 
COVID and the kind of changing remote work environment has impacted design. And I think design, at least in my experience, you think of like getting people together in a room for a focus group or having some people sit around a computer and use software together and observing how that works or ethnographic research where you watch somebody engage with a product or in a store or in a setting. So thinking about the, the kind of changing dynamics of the world we live and work in. Um, how has that changed the way that you think about collaborating with designers? Uh, and, and how have you kind of adopted different practices to adjust for the remote nature of collaboration today? Um, so with design, I wanna start off by talking about looking at remote working as constraint, right? So we, when we think about it, we think about okay, now that we have to work remote, it's a constraint. And from a design perspective, we've always worked with constraints. Like back in the day before, you know, the, the internet, we had to work on a fixed piece of paper or fixed canvas, and that was a constraint. And then the, the website came and I mean, the internet came small screens, the screens gets bigger, we think it, that's constraint. And then smartphones come along we design apps everything that we do there's there are always constraints and uh, with with the COVID situation it has put another form of constraint in our work in our ways of working which as you mentioned is like doing research um, interestingly what I found is that although we have to do you know user testing remotely and do research remotely because the whole population is going online and doing remote, the users that you're testing with are also quite used to doing things remotely. So, you know, three years ago, trying to do interview someone or test a prototype with someone across the world may be difficult because you have to teach them how to connect online. But now everybody's so used to that. Like, interestingly, you know, it, it works out in that way. Um, However, I also want to caution that just because we can do that doesn't mean that that's the way we should keep doing when we can actually go and meet people in person because nothing beats the contextual inquiry, the ethnographic research that we can do. Observing someone where they work or where they are in, the, in their environment and being able to spot certain uh, things that you may not be able to if you're just doing remotely. So, you know, that's one thing that I want to point out. Um, in, another thing is also collaboration. Um, we used to run uh, workshop sessions with clients in their office or our office or a, a separate location. That's what we used to do. And however, uh, similar to the user interviews, our clients are also used to working online, working remotely. So somehow we're still able to emulate um, or stimulate that, that environment, although it doesn't re replace it because of a lot of new tools that are coming up um, that we can use. Th things like mural boards, murals, they're mentioned in their articles that are super helpful. And yeah, it's very interesting to see how we adapt to the environment and use whatever tools are there um, in order to be able to deliver on what we have to. Um, yeah, so that, that's my primary observation. And the important thing is not to substitute whatever, um, you know, we currently have as, as the new way to do things, because that doesn't really um, replace that the human connection that you have when we work with clients in person. Um, and then another thing, this may not apply to this. I don't think this applies to only designers, but because of this remote working, I think it also opens up a lot of opportunity for people now that working uh, remote working has become more of a standard, like people can work from anywhere. Like really now, like that's that's become the norm, and I I see it as like an opportunity rather than a constraint. So yeah, that that shift is quite interesting. Talking about opportunity, I think that's a there's some really good points in there, and I, I you know I've realized I've kind of thought myself about how it changes the way you manage teams, the way you engage with organizations, the way you kind of connect with colleagues. Uh, and that's kind of before you even get to then how do you do all those things and build products, build experiences and, and build um, things that people want to use. But on the opportunity point, 
one of the topics in the in the magazine is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, this is a topic that's relevant across all of the industries that that we work in. And you know, not lost on me is the fact that at the final count, it's five, four of us on this call that are men. Um, how can we as organizational leaders improve our, our kind of organization's approach to DEI? Like what are the, the tactical things that we can do to drive change and, and kind of what strategies, tips and advice would all of you suggest to help with that? Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll oh, just off. Off. Yeah. But, uh, I think the, you know, the, the first thing is I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, um, DNI should be a, a core pillar of, of any organization. First of all, uh, you know, because that's, I think, what organizations demand of their leaders in terms of having a clear strategy in place that is measurable with KPIs and concrete progress uh, being made. You know, it needs to go beyond some slogans on a website or, or you know, something that you just say, but then nothing happens behind the scenes. Um, I think that's the first thing, you know, I think employees just demand it of their leaders. I think the second reason is, you know, I think there was a, a McKinsey report that actually said and that found that companies actually made uh, significant progress on the DNI front actually outperform their peers. So it's not only good for your people and, and your organization, but also for business. So um, that's why I think it should be a, a core pillar of uh, of any company strategy to to make some significant inroads on on the DEI uh, front, and I think you know there's probably two things, and I can elaborate a little bit on them uh, that I would uh, I think is important as a leader. I think the first thing is I think you need to be honest with yourself on where you are on your personal DEI journey. Uh, I mean uh, because. Well, and, and then the second thing, and then I'll elaborate a bit. The second thing is you need to put that concrete, measurable action plan in place and show progress that you're making. And for me, those are the two things. And to elaborate a little bit more on, on the first one, um, there was a really helpful model, I find, that, uh, you know, helps you with that self-reflection. Uh, and it asks you a few questions. And it basically divides your, uh, you know, your, your personal situation up in three zones. Uh, one is the fear zone. It's basically, you know, you kind of avoid the issue, you kind of deny there's an issue around racial equity, etc. And, you know, you just try to be comfortable so you don't ask too many questions. Or if something happens like a microaggression, as it's called, you kind of swipe it under the carpet. It was like, you know, no, no bad intent. It's all good. Then you're probably in the fear zone, which is not a good zone to be in. Uh, the second zone would be, you know, are you recognizing the issues? Uh, are you seeking out questions that actually, and the answer to questions that actually makes you uncomfortable? Uh, are you actually educating yourself? Because it's not the task of people of color or of women to educate us white men uh, of, you know, what should be done. It's, it's your role yourself to go and seek out as leaders and, and you know, uh, privileged leaders um, in a way to kind of find out more of that information. That, that's what's called the learning zone. And then the other zone is the growth zone where actually you're actively advocating uh, with your peers, uh, you know, and you're driving the change. And, and so it's really important that for you as a leader, before you say anything to your organization to, and you can talk to your organization, so to find out where are you currently on your own journey? So I think that's the first thing is self-reflection uh, before you take any action. I think then when you, once you know where you are and where you need to develop, I think then it's about putting that very concrete action plan in place. Because if you don't have that self-awareness, you won't come across as authentic to your organization. And you're being, being clear about your shortcomings. Uh, it's a very uncomfortable place to, to be, but you, know, you, need to, you need to have that vulnerability as a leader first. Then put that concrete action plan in place that is really measurable, that you actually link them back to people's KPIs, potentially even their compensation, their performance ratings, et cetera. And so I'll, give, I'll just give uh, three quick examples in terms of what we put in place at the time at WB and they're still living. So the first one is, it was a pillar around, we continuously learn and we all develop ourselves to create this uh, active, anti-racist culture and there was you know a, an annual program and it's still running you know around lunch and learns uh, there is even a book and a film club uh, there's a there are panel discussions there's unconscious bias training this quarterly whole DEI week and the KPI for that was that we expect every employee and it was in everybody's performance plan uh, to dedicate at least one full day a quarter 
to educating themselves around DEI topics and uh, that needed to be discussed, you know, at the year, you know, what have you learned? What did you do, et cetera? So that was one pillar. The second pillar was around, you know, building a talented and diverse team and some concrete KPIs was around women representation in management, people of color representation across the business. Uh, it was around diverse slates of candidates for, uh, you know, when we when we had positions uh, open, but equally diverse slates of interviewers. Um, uh, so there was clear KPIs around that. And then the third pillar, which was more on our branded side, uh, which was, you know, do we have uh, brands that represent the diverse communities that we are serving with our brands? And we had, for example, we did an audit of all of our imagery. And we put concrete targets around representation of uh, minorities within uh, those uh, those assets so that we could truly represent those consumers. We extended our testing panels for our skincare products, for example, because if you just take a rep base, you might not have enough people of color in there in some geographies to have a real read. Is, is this product working? So uh, there was a skincare school, etc. So there were so many things, but it, it, it centered around those three things. You know, one is do we have a learning culture do we have you know the right organization and diversity in our own teams and that that extended to our supply like our agencies etc uh, and then thirdly uh, you know our brands how are they showing up to our consumers um, that's really where we took some action great that's helpful kevin can i pivot to you because i think there's another aspect to this in terms of data and, and some of the ways that our data is either inclusive or not, and then the kind of features and things we build off of that data that then might include inherent bias. And, and so from your perspective, you know, generally, what are some tactics you've seen it, it, that have been successful? Um, but then specifically, when you think about data and the role data can play and, and kind of diversity and equity and inclusion as it, as it kind of connects to that, how can companies make sure that their data sets are, are representative? Right. Um, I mean, I think the first key to that is to, uh, most models obviously are, are, are all models are built on some sort of seed, some sort of initial data set, right? And uh, it's, it's the data in there that is biased, which then gets replicated, if you will, or expanded by the models and, and, and algorithms that we're using. Um, and, and, and the way to look at it is pretty simple. If you're, if you're a, a company that uh, has traditionally only hired white males, then your model set data set is only going to have white males. And if you're trying to predict what you know, employees are most likely to say join the firm or, or be successful at the firm, you're probably going to end up with the answer of white males. Um, and so you have to be very cognizant. And this, and this isn't new. I mean, bias has always been a problem with data. So we're not saying, we're not telling data scientists that you have to, for the first time in your life, look at the data before you, and make sure you understand what's in it before you, before you use it for something. That's like part and parcel of the, of, of the, of the, of the, the, the data, you know, development of the model or analytic process. It just, now you have to look at it, uh, from, a, from a, from a perspective that you may not have done previously. Um, is everyone represented? Uh, and once you figured that out, it, it can be challenging. And there, there are approaches. You can, you can uh, overweigh certain groups of people. Um, you can separate your data sets apart so that you basically build a model for different groups of people. Um, you can, you can uh, although in the end, sometimes you don't have the data and you just have to apply, and this is challenging itself, you have to apply sort of human um, ethics to the outcomes, uh, but that assumes that the human who is doing this has the ethics that the company wants to uh, promote. Uh, so, so it's not enough for uh, uh, the data scientists themselves to review the outcome. You need to make certain that on things like this, you have a wider community. Uh, a lot of companies will have diversity and in, in inclusion groups of various nature. Uh, and uh, when it's, it's, it's a, a, a topic that like hiring or, you know, whatever, topics that are that, that sort of ripe for, for challenges to uh, make certain that the, the outcomes are presented to such groups so that they can look at it because there's stuff you're going to miss. I mean, it's, 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 hard to, it's hard to find everything and just, you know, sh show this stuff to the community, under explain to them how you, what the data looked like, how it was biased, 
what you did to change it, what the outcome is going to do. And then when the outcome comes out, make sure you analyze the, 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 what it looks like and are, is everyone being represented and present that as well and, and, and be open to some serious criticism. But it's not easy it, 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 because it's the, the, it would be a lot easier if we were building it on data that has already been inclusive and diverse, but we're not. And so it's, it, you can't just let the data drive it. Salim, how, how do you think about these topics with regard to design? How do, how do you design for inclusion? How do you, how do you create in, um, inclusive design processes, if you will? Mm. That, um, that's always a challenge in, in design um, because when you design, you, have, you do want to think about the end users and their, their cultural backgrounds and their ethnicity or you know, certain... Um, whatever challenges that they may may they may have and um, we we try to do our best to you know recruit the right type of participants based on the the segment that the client is targeting um i i think that the best way to um design inclusively would be to involve like have a diverse team right so first first of all have have a diverse team um, the, the team itself that is designing for the people should be diverse so that the different uh, backgrounds and different um, cultures and values are represented. Um, and I also think that you might want to consider um, for accessibility, right? So the people who don't have um, the certain physical challenges, designing for someone who has those challenges, um, they, they can't really empathize right a hundred percent so having someone to test your apps for example would be one way one way to do it and and then the the other thing would be to be very conscious about you know who you're designing for as as we already do but i, I think there's a, a when, when projects are rushed uh when when there's not enough budget there's you know you always have these different constraints that i was talking about earlier so being able to advocate for that and the importance of um, in inclusivity in your design process as well is uh, fundamentally important. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's really helpful and, and good practical advice for, for how to think about it. So we have about five minutes before we open it for Q&A. So if you have questions and you wanna get them into the Q&A, please go ahead and, and do that and then we'll take some time to answer them. Um, while our participants do that, I, I think the, the way that I wanted to close this is to just reflect on the fact that 2021 marks the 10 year anniversary for General Assembly. And we're, we're really excited to be able to celebrate and share this milestone with all of you. Um, Looking back, though, over the last decade, even just over the last two years, there's been incredible change, and, and that's change to how we work, changes to how we collaborate, changes to how we purchase products, um, changes in every aspect of our, our lives. So uh, from the, the three of you, I'm really interested, what advice do you each have for leaders who are thinking about the, the future of work, and, and how should they go about thinking about that? What types of things should they be looking for and planning to adjust for? Kevin, maybe we can start with you on this one. Sure. Um, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll start with the sort of the, the great resignation because that's on everyone's mind, right? And obviously that's going to shed some light on, on, on the future of work. Um, I have seen it called, and, and I'm, I'm trying to quote this right, a, a sort of worker's revolution and an uprising against bad bosses and tone deaf companies that just don't pay people enough and don't give them the right benefits. Um, um, Okay, but basically what that means is, is people, I think I'm gonna interpret that is people are just looking to be treated fairly uh, in terms of compensation, benefits, work-life balance, uh, and, and perhaps most importantly, being valued and heard, which is kind of part and parcel with the conversation we were having earlier with diversity and inclusion. Um, this, the, the, there's good news and bad news about this. The good news is this is pretty basic stuff when you think about it, right? It's, it's treating people humanely, I guess, and, and fairly and, and with compassion. Um, and that, that shouldn't be that hard to get to. And yet, and yet we all know it can be hard to get to. So 
So it's kind of like, you know, what is that? The, all I needed to know I learned in kindergarten or, you know, these, these basic truths. I think if, I think people are finally fed up a little bit and, and want to be treated according to those basic truths. And that's not so hard. We should be able to get there. Yeah, just building off that, I would fully agree. I think, uh, you know, the, the first thing is listen to your employees, <laughs> you know, uh, to, to define what is right. Because again, um, particularly as leaders, you sometimes do end up a bit um, disconnected from reality. I think there were some interesting stats in the in the report as well that basically said that I think it was like 60 70 percent of uh, bosses think that they're empowering but only 30 percent of employees feel the same way so so that that just you know brings that to life in a very you know uh, obvious way so I think the first thing is you know listen to your employees um, and because uh, you know uh, I think that's where the truth lies now if I would be a betting man I think in terms of future of work I think blended is probably going to be the right answer because, and, and flexibility, actually, because um, what's right for one person is not right for another person. You know, uh, here, you know, we had lots of discussions around, you know, um, how, how strong do, strongly do we encourage people to come back to an office or not? You know, it, it's a real because it was interesting, you know, for us. Actually, the people who wanted to come back to an office, regardless of us opening it up, was actually... Uh, people who were flat sharing because <laughs> they didn't have enough rooms for everybody to kind of have a, a proper office space. So they were doing it from the side of their bed, uh, you know, so they were keen to come back. And interestingly, also quite a few parents because they couldn't deal with the kids anymore at home. Uh, but then it was that middle group that's like, you know, we're absolutely fine continuing to work from home. So again, I think flexibility will be a key factor within that and allowing people to do what is right for them. And that's why I do think that the, the future will be flexible and will be blended. With blended, I mean, you know, people have the option of working a few days from home uh, in the week. Uh, I do believe that there is an element of culture and, uh, you know, and benefit from actually having some face-to-face -face time with folks. So, so I do think, uh, you know, I personally believe uh, you know, if if I would be then voting, I would probably vote a few days in the office, a few days from home, and you know that flexibility. Um, but yeah, that's that's my perspective. In in, in terms of that, I'll, I'll jump it before if I can. Sure. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to remember in that flexible environment is that's going to work and has worked right now a whole lot better, if you will, with more senior employees. One of the things companies don't do very well still is onboarding. And in the remote world or the flexible world, with, when companies are hiring more junior employees or the more, as they hire junior employees, they can't rely on the, the informal face-to-face -face mentoring and, and you know, desk to desk mentoring that they've had in the past. Even the smaller companies are gonna have to create very formalized training and resource to help people with, with proper onboarding continued continuous education, otherwise the, that the new employees are just not going to be able to adapt very well. Song, did you have anything you wanted to offer there? Yeah, I wasn't sure if we have time. Go if we it. have time, I can add a bit. Yeah. Um, so adding on to both of what Kevin and um, Christoph said, um, the point that I want to add is about employee fulfillment. Um, mm -hmm. I think there is a, a lot of companies are measuring employee engagement and you get engagement if you do the basic things, if you paid, paid your salary, if you, uh, you know, give them some perks, but are people actually finding meaning in, in your work? And if, if they find fulfillment, that's when you get productivity high because they'll go the extra mile without you having to ask them to, right? So um, the future of work, I think people will want to work at companies and organizations where they find meaning and fulfillment. And that, that comes from, you know, the, the buzzword that's been going around for, for many years now, like work-life balance. And what is work-life balance will be different and will change just like uh, Christoph said, that it will be different for everybody. But uh, figuring that out and make, making it work, that's, that's really important. And I find personally, that working remotely I'm, uh, works well for me, but for some people, like Christoph said, 
it, it might not work because they have a tiny room and they have roommates, right? And, or want to get away from their kids. But um, I know a lot of people uh, in several companies, they are moving to companies that allow them to work remotely 100% how, how, wherever they want. And there are other certain companies that are insisting that, no, we have to be together. That's why, you know, that's how we build the culture. Um, but I see that culture culture changes and it's evolving, right? So what we think as culture now or how to build culture is not different. Uh, it's different from five years ago, ten years ago, and the what culture is is very different. I find that working remotely, you actually know more about your coworkers than you would have because now you get to see their rooms and their kids and your dogs and things that you probably normally wouldn't talk about. You actually, you know, like remote working actually brings people closer together, like, which is quite ironic. So yeah, that's the observation that uh, I want to share. And yeah. That's, that's interesting. I, it, you either get to see their rooms or their blurry rooms one, one way or the other. Uh, so you mentioned <laughs> culture a few times. Uh, one of the questions that came in moving to Q and A is around the the book by Patrick Lencioni uh, called The Advantage. And the, the Advantage talks about organizational health as a kind of key component of organizations being successful. Um, I have not read it, but I, I think it the, the focus is on kind of when organizations are healthy, they're whole, they're consistent and complete, management is aligned, operations are aligned, there's kind of a unified culture that threads through the organization. Curious one, have any of you read that book and and if you have any kind of thoughts on it but if not do you have kind of thoughts on unification of of strategy and and how that benefits organizations looks like no one having read it i'm, I'm seeing head shakes so um yeah, i haven't read the book but i mean uh, the principles you've outlined i think are, are are absolutely true you know in terms of and it was mentioned before as well, I think a lot of organizations are now actively measuring uh, employee engagement. And then, you know, you have a few companies that make a good buck on the back of that. But, you know, usually they come back with some, you know, where I think it sometimes goes wrong is that you end up with a very long action plan and then nothing really happens. And, you know, so I think what's important is to be choiceful around what are the main things that are going to drive that employee engagement? Because I think engaged employees is just, better for everybody you know in terms of well-being for the employees but equally for for, for business results it's, it's like with de and i i think it's a crucial element um and i think you know whilst in the past maybe businesses was more like yeah you know jfdi <laughs> i'm the boss so you do whatever i want uh that, that is not working anymore if you want uh an, an engaged employee force and i think rightfully so because people want to be treated with respect and and, and driving that as a cultural vein throughout the organization, I think is, is absolutely crucial for the long-term success of, of the business and the organization. And, and I haven't, I haven't read the, the, the book either, but I've, I've, I've had a few people tell me some things about it. I, and I believe one of the key attributes or is, is an organization that has a clear sense of vision and mission and is sort of aligned toward that vision and mission, um, sort of a holistic view, I guess, of the, of the organization, organization. Um, and um, I think we've all experienced working at companies that don't have that. In fact, I think a lot of companies don't have that. And I think a lot of teams don't have that. Um, I'm not saying I've got this down pat, but one of the things that I, I always do if I say and inherit a team is I, I get the team together. I give them a week or two to, to um, develop a vision and a mission for their team. And I can't tell you the times, the number of times that they can't. They, they're, 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 they, they don't understand what their role is in the company. They don't understand what their goal is in the company. Uh, this is a problem for multiple reasons. You know, everybody knows, uh, what is this? Cut, uh, employee satisfaction uh, surveys are so closely tied to many things, but to understanding what your role is. Uh, and, and usually I find uh, that, like I said, they, they don't know what their vision and mission is. And often that's a, a that, that problem comes from multiple levels, one of which is organizational. The teams might not be properly uh, split up. There, there might be duplication of efforts or one team might have 20 different things they're supposed to be working on and therefore they don't really, they're completely different. And so I will often go through that exercise and, and 
work with other leaders to basically that might be a sign that you have to reorganize your teams a bit. It might be a sign that you need to send some flags up to senior leadership saying you need to tell everybody what we're here for. Um, so I think that's a big part of it. I think that's a big need. And I think the other big part of it is, is, is the ability to be agile. I, I, we've all worked, well, I've worked at small little startups and I've worked at, you know, large Titanics, some of the Titanics and the proper uh, analogy and others, just large ships. Uh, and, and, and they don't always, um, they don't always learn from their mistakes and, and, and move along quickly enough. Uh, and I think part of that is, uh, part of that can be addressed by, by allowing uh, a more hearing the voices from the bottom up and acting on them. It's not just window dressing where it's like, okay, well, tell us what you think, but actually taking good ideas and, and, and implementing them because the people on the ground, as it were, in the front lines, they know what's working and what, what's not necessarily working maybe better, oftentimes better than, than management will. And, and being aware of that and, 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 and letting them drive the ship a little bit is a, is a great idea for, for ensuring that a company, A, can, can, can adjust. So if you have those two things where you have a really good mission and vision and a, an agile approach where you can adjust things on the fly so it goes in the right direction, I think that goes a long way. I, th I think that's something having to do with the, the, what, what the, the development by organizational health. Yeah, thank you. I, I've always liked Conway's law, which is a, an adage that organizations design systems that mirror their communication structures within the organization. And I think it plays in here where to your point about structure and mission and vision, if it's clear how communication moves across the organization and how teams work together, communication implying things about cross-functional ability to work together, how your work fits in with the work of other teams, you get systems and experiences that feel more kind of whole end to end. But when your teams are working in silos, they're not agile, there's lack of understanding of how your work fits into the next part, uh, you get systems and, and experiences that, that mirror that sometimes. Um, we'll go with one last question here before we wrap up. What, what does the future of work look like 10 years from now? So it's, it's 2021, uh, looking forward to, to 2031. Any last thoughts from all of you on, on what the future of work looks like? What skills are in demand? And, and Sung, maybe we'll, we'll go with you to start. Well, 20, uh, 10 years from now, right? So I think the, the big thing that's going on right now, like, and over the last three years, maybe three to five years is problem solving, right? People talk about like, I'm a problem solver, I'm a problem solver. And I, I think in 10 years from now, that won't be the case anymore, but actually identifying problems, like working with clients and helping them realize and uh, find out what how many problems they have, or if they're focusing on the wrong problems. I think those kind of skills, people that have um, the, the skills to identify problems, I, I think that'll be really important. Um, the ability to come up with original ideas, um, that will still be a relevant skill because as we all know, the, the robots are coming, right? And they'll take any job that can be broken down into processes and steps. So um, the skills that allow, allow us to create something out of intuition, about, out of our own experience or culture and environment, those will be really useful for, for designers in particular, but also the, all the workers in general. Yeah, maybe I can build on that. I mean, and of course, I'm, I'm coming at this partly from a marketing uh, kind of angle, but I think, you know, th there's, I think there's a number of evergreen kind of skills that will remain valid. Uh, in, I mean, if you, even if you look at today versus 50 years ago, uh, some of these skills are still the same. And, uh, you know, so similar to some of the ones that Sang just mentioned, I think, you know, if it's around curiosity and consumer centricity and consumer centric thinking. I think that will be a skill that remains valid 
Uh, it was valid 50 years ago. It's valid now and it's valid. It's going to be valid in the future, you know, in terms of what are those consumer journeys and experiences that you want to provide to your consumers. So people who are good at that, I think, have a bright future ahead. You know, how do you design a brand and a product that is rooted in culture and consumer needs? I mean, that won't go away. Uh, you know, how do you design great content again that consumers just crave and want? Uh, you know, and, and and how do you do that along a conversion funnel? You know, how do you make people aware of your brand? So those principles and skills, I think, will remain valid. How you do your content publishing will probably look very, very different. How you can, you know, and, and in the, the opportunities you have to create a really exciting uh, customer journey um, will have evolved by then. I mean, I'm not, uh, I mean, otherwise, probably I should play some uh, really careful investments. I'm not, not uh, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but but, you know what what will be the winning ones unfortunately but you know it, it will just be done slightly different i think what is true though is uh, and that's where i think that will only enhance or strengthen versus today's analytic skills but think about marketeers often they might be good at the things that i've just mentioned but uh, a gap often is around data martech you know, data-driven marketing and optimization, uh, personalization, segmentation skills, those kind of things I think will only gain in importance as, as per some of the discussions we had. And then I think more in general, beyond marketing, is, is I think leadership skills. I mean, we talked about this, you know, uh, and what they would call, uh, I don't know why they call them like this, soft leadership skills, <laughs> you know, collaboration, uh, you know, listening skills, those kind of things I think will only gain in importance as per some of the, you know, discussions we just had today. I saw a, a, a comment or a, uh, a post by Simon Sinek recently where he says there are no soft skills, like they're human skills. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which yeah, I thought quite interesting. Yeah. Kevin, any final thoughts on that one? Um, sure. Uh, so so I'm, I guess I'm the technologist here. So, I mean, I, there is going to be some technology that are going to be with us probably forever <laughs> the basic ones like linear and logistic regression just because they're going to set some baselines for more advanced methods but uh, data science and data science technology is moving so quickly that it's a, a fool's errand to try to predict what technologies are going to be invoked 10 years from now uh, the languages we use all this other stuff is probably going to change uh, but I, I just going to mirror what's already been said there are, there are some things that will always remain important um, and uh, whether they're soft or human, um, understanding business needs and, and translating that into a technical solution. Uh, so problem identification, uh, problem store, uh, solving, uh, storytelling, uh, which is key because as technology gets more difficult and advanced, it's, it's, it requires even better ability to take a hard topic and turn it into something that can be understood. And then domain knowledge uh, is always gonna remain in high demand. The technology just comes and goes and you just have to keep up with it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Right on time. I have 1259. I just want to thank everybody, um, our attendees for joining today, taking time to, to, to participate. Um, our panelists, thank you so much for your time as well. And then the folks in the background who set the, the session up and, and helped facilitate, really appreciate them as well. Um, thank you, everyone. Stay safe, stay well, and, and take care. Thanks.